Shalom, and welcome to this special program of the Ghetto Fighters House International Online Series Talking Memory. The topic of today's program is the Austrian cinema during the Nazi regime between alliance and resistance, with guest speaker Professor Klaus Samo Davidovich in conversation with Dr. Dana Dana Massad. My name is Medin Shachar, and I work at the Ghetto Fighters House as a guide and an educator, and I want to welcome our global audience including friends and colleagues from Holocaust museums and centers, Jewish heritage institutions, academics, and students from universities, historians, and our many friends who attend the Talking Memories series. A special welcome as always to the survivors and their families that are with us today. I wanted to thank everyone for their support and interest in our programs. Today's program is in partnership with our friends at the Friedrich Ebert Foundation in Israel. The Friedrich Ebert Foundation is a German foundation whose goal is to promote a free society based on the values of solidarity. The foundation is a partner in the educational museum activities of the Ghetto Fighters House, including the museum's week-long events for International Holocaust Remembrance Day. You can find details on all the programs on the Ghetto Fighters House website. I would also like to thank my colleague, the historian Dr. Tamir Hod, who organized today's program. And now I would like to invite the CEO of the Ghetto Fighters House, to deliver the opening remarks. Egal? I think you're on mute. Okay. okay. Dear guests, this week we mark International Holocaust Remembrance Day, the 77th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz-Birkenau, this camp has become a symbol of the evil that humanity is capable of creating. At the Ghetto Fighters House, we have chosen to engage in the power of the human spirit and its ability to resist this evil. This resistance was expressed in various ways during the Holocaust and World War II. The spirit of rebellion gripped Jewish and non-Jewish people and groups in Europe and abroad. It is expressed in a comprehensive way in the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising that became a symbol of resistance to the old world. For us, dealing with resistance and the human spirit is an essential and inspiring task that today, more than ever, we have instilled, instilled in the younger generation as we take on the responsibility of telling this story from the survivors. From all these, those groups and people who made the brave choice to oppose the Nazi regime, we chose to engage in resistance precisely in Austria. It is crucial for us to shine a spotlight, spotlight on those inspiring cases and learn from them. And no less important to show the different voices than there are in every society, the voice of courage and extraordinary heroism. I want to thank the Friedrich Ebert Foundation, Dr. Paul Pasch, director of the foundation in Israel and Judith Stelmach, the active manager of programs for our partnership and the remarkable way we work together. Thanks to Professor Klaus Davidovich and Dr. Dana Mas Masad, our guest today. Many thanks to you, Meidin Shachar, for leading the international lecture series and to, and to Dr. Tamir Hod for your participation and organization this event. In the conversation this evening, Finally, I want to thank all of you, our global audience, for joining us today. I wish us all a meaningful and interesting program. Thank you. Thank you, Igal. And now I would like to invite Judith Stalmach, who will speak on behalf of the Friedrich Ebert Foundation. Judith. Thank you. Uh, good evening, shalom, and uh, welcome to everybody. Um, this is really exciting uh, to participate in such an event uh, 
in the week in which uh, we commemorate the International Holocaust Remembrance Day uh, with so many people from all over the world. Um, I must say this is an overwhelming feeling to be part of this. So thank you everybody who have joined us tonight. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, I'm with representing tonight the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung, the German Political Social Democratic Foundation uh, that has been working for democracy and social justice since 1925. Um, the Israel office of the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung that was officially opened in 1978 fulfills a particularly important role. It engages with the history of Israel and Germany and the legacy of the Shoah as we realize that we cannot look into the future without dealing with the past. We therefore particularly value our partnership with the Ghetto Fighters House Museum, as we share the understanding of the importance of remembering the Shoah, learning as much as possible about this dark period in our history and sharing this knowledge with as many people as possible, especially with young people. We also share the goal of advancing humanistic values, as Egan mentioned before, in particular in view of the terrible consequences of the absence of such values. Um, I would like to thank my colleagues at the Ghetto Fighters House, Egal Cohen, Chava Cohen, Medin Shachar, Tamir Hod, and Shira Haltat, for the pleasant and professional cooperation that made this evening possible and also um, our uh, event on Thursday that was mentioned by Madin. I also want to welcome uh, you, Professor Davidovich, uh, as our guest speaker from Vienna, and thank you uh, for your participation. On a personal note, I would like to mention that as a Viennese, and uh, also as a person um, who has been dealing with cinema, uh, for many years of my professional life and uh, that this is still my passion also on, uh, in, in my private life. Uh, I'm, I'm really, really curious to hear your talk, uh, Professor Davidovich. Um, surprisingly enough, um, or maybe not so surprisingly, we can discuss it maybe, uh, the story of Austrian cinema during the Nazi regime is not very well known. Uh, and I think uh, that uh, you are one of the few experts who have researched this issue thoroughly. So I'm very much looking forward uh, to your talk. And with no further ado, um, I'm passing on the torch to Medin and uh, then to Dr. Dana Massad. And I wish everybody a pleasant uh, and interesting evening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Toda. You did for those kind words. I would like to now give the floor to Dr. Dana Massad, who is a lecturer on Israeli film at the Open University in Israel. And she will be leading today's conversation with Professor Klaus Davidovich. And I have to say, just like you did, I um, am so waiting for this uh, talk because film and the use of visuals and how they are used in, in, in the world to influence who we are and how we are in our culture, it's, it's going to be a fascinating conversation. So thank you very much for uh, doing this this evening. And the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Medine, and thank you, Judith and Tamir and Nigal for this opp opportunity to talk a, a really, um, a, to talk about a really an unknown subject as the Austrian uh, cinema. So uh, let me introduce you, Professor Klaus Samuel Davidovich, German and, and cultural scientist and professor of Jewish studies at the University of Vienna in Austria. Along with Frank Stern, he is the director of the Jewish Film Club Vienna. And together with Frank Stern and Ernst Kenninger, the founder of Film University at the Film Archive Austria. He is also a teacher for Jewish history at the Vienna Jewish School. Good evening, Klaus. Good evening, Dana. Hello. <laughs> so we have a very interesting talk to tonight. And uh, obviously, as we do these days, I'm going to make a share first and then we'll start talking. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll do that. And um, just a sec. And so, um, Klaus, um, where to, be where, where to begin? Mm. Um, 
I would like to start with the real big question. I mean, before we're going to ask some question about Australia and cinema before, during and after the Nazi regime. Mm -hmm. Can you say something about Australian cinema? Is it, if any, can we uh, describe, um, can we define this in, um, in a different way from German cinema? Um, yeah. That's my first question to you. <laughs> yeah, there's also a, um, a huge problem in the um, scientific literature because um, not only if you are dealing with um, yeah, literature, uh, for example, Franz Kafka or other writers, they are often uh, brought together with the German um, writers. And um, we always say the common language is the difference between Austria and Germany. And um, of course, there was and is an Austrian cinema. Uh, it, uh, it differs not only in the, um, yeah, uh, in the backgrounds and the kind of actresses or actors or directors, but uh, it's, a, it's a different country with a different heritage because when the Austrian cinema started uh, to become famous in the 20s, it was after the collapse of the Habsburg Empire. And we have all the um, um, uh, lines uh, which are going back to Hungary or to um, former Yugoslavia and our Czech, Czech Republic. And also the, the um, directors and actors came with their background from those countries. And this is such a huge uh, cultural difference between uh, uh, Germany and Austria. For example, one of the most uh, famous uh, act, um, directors from Hungary was Michali, Michali Kertes, uh, who went to Vienna and shot a very important um, uh, epic uh, movie, Sodom and Gomorrah or Moon of Israel, um, with uh, Jewish topics, by the way. And then he went to, like many of the uh, talents, to um, Hollywood and became well, Michael yeah. Curtis. Yeah, well, just before we're going to say something about this yeah. uh, great escape to America and Hollywood, yeah. it's important to notice that uh, Austrian filmmakers, actresses, composer yeah. did work in German film cinema, German film industry during the 20s, right? Yeah. And they, uh, for another famous example is uh, Fritz Lang, yeah. who worked in, in, in Germany, but uh, he was Austrian. Or Billy Wilder or others who uh, went um, to Germany or back to Austria and then to Hollywood. But uh, it was uh, a difference between the um, German film industry and the Austrian uh, film industry. And... Later, after the Second World War, it's uh, a national uh, cinema of its own. There are huge differences between the you know, Austrian cinema today and the German cinema today. But if we talk about the, 20, the, the, the 20s and the 30s, we can see a, a, all kinds of relationships yeah. between mm -hmm. these two cinematic industries, right? Yeah. So, so it's going to complicate the things for us if you want to speak and talk about this um, uh, Austrian uh, or versus German cinema during the Nazi regime. Um, can we say a few words about this great escape uh, mm -hmm. to America? Because um, once um, beginning late 20s, beginning of the 30s, we can see a very big fleeting to America about, yeah, could you say a few words about this? And I'm going to while you're going to make some name dropping, uh, yeah. dropping, I'm going to put some visuals for that. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, today, many people think that uh, the horror begin, began in Austria in 1938 with the so-called uh, connection with the Anschluss to um, Nazi Germany. But uh, um, already in the 20s, we have here in Vienna, we had here in Vienna strong anti-Semitism and the rise of the illegal uh, Nazis uh, in Austria. And so many uh, talents who were Jewish or were uh, from the left uh, uh, wings 
and they um, already tried to escape to America or to, or to England, for example, the Corda family, who was uh, very famous uh, in Austria um, uh, during the 20s. And um, the problem is um, when, when you see, for example, the biography here, we see uh, Fred Zinnemann. Um, he went to uh, Hollywood already in the 20s, but he was raised in Vienna. He was born in Poland, but he was raised in Vienna and he went uh, to school to, in Vienna and also to university. And he um, suffered under the strong anti-Semitism uh, uh, at, this, at, the, at school, at the university, and also he was, uh, he, he loved to climb the mountains. And then uh, he founded a Jewish so-called Alpenverein, a community for, for climbers, because there was such a strong anti-Semitism in the uh, uh, non-Jewish uh, um, uh, society for climbers. And uh, so he he was in Hollywood uh, during the Shoah, but he tried to help his parents who were killed uh, during the Shoah. He, sh he sent uh, visas and affidavits and stuff like that, but uh, those papers never reached uh, his family and he could only manage to, um, yeah, to rescue his brother who was very famous in the American army. And um, so we have uh, talents who uh, already went to um, the States uh, in the 20s or in the beginning of the 30s. Composers like Max Steiner, like Korngold, or, or later directors like uh, mm -hmm. Fritz Lang, yeah. or producers like uh, Sam Spiegel, or here's EBC, um, Otto Preminger. But, you know, um, they were talents who uh, created her uh, first works in, yeah, in Austria or in Germany. And then they had to deal with the different uh, language in, in, England, uh, in England or in the States. And it's what was not so easy uh, sometimes uh, for, when, for them um, when they are, were actresses or actors. Uh, producers or uh, writers or directors, it was easier for them. If you see uh, or you watch uh, uh, interviews with Billy Wilder or with Otto Preminger, you still hear the uh, Austrian accent in their English, but um, some of the actors, they couldn't speak English and they started to work and they had to to, to remind all the lines by heart and they didn't know what it, what it mean it, to translate it. And this was very horrible for them to, um, to went into immigration. Max Reinhardt, uh, he was such a great uh, director and he only shot one movie in Hollywood, the um, Midsummer Night's Dream. But it's important to say these are really central figures in Hollywood as well. So this yeah. is a massive, uh, escape to Hollywood with a very important all kinds of film uh, producer, directors, actresses. Mm -hmm. So the question is what's left? I mean, before they went to Hollywood, most of them went to Germany and then from Germany, they went to Hollywood. Mm -hmm. So what was left in uh, Austria's cinema, Austria film industry by, by, by the late uh, 30s? Mm -hmm. um... You, uh, you, uh, you know uh, that um, um, Goebbels thought, uh, the propaganda minister, he thought he could replace the Jews very easily. And uh, sometimes it was very strange when there was a, um, a famous comedian, for example, uh, Felix Brezard, who played in To Be or Not To Be. He is the one who always wants to... Uh, 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 say this famous dialogue from the Merchant of Venice in To Be or Not To Be. And let's move it to be or not to be, right? Yeah, and, uh, from, and then he replaced uh, him with an, an upcoming actor. Uh, his name was Theo Lingen, who was very um, uh, famous later. But so they choose new actors to replace the old ones even when they are, um, they are similar in shape or in kind of uh, comedy or stuff like that. And so 
perhaps some of the great actors of the 30s or later 40s or even after the Second World War would never have been so great if the former actresses or directors had been um, yeah, not uh, forced to, uh, to leave the country. Yeah. yeah, because of the void these people left behind. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we want to say a few words about the Austrian film industry during the Nazi regime. I mean, can we speak about Austrian or German Nazi cinema? And I would really like you to introduce us because I, I, I don't think most of our audience know these examples. If you could please say a few words about uh, companies like Vian Film Companies and others, which are very important to, to, to understand this specific time in history. Uh, first, we, we have to keep in mind that uh, Goebbels and also Hitler, they didn't use film just um, as an example or as another thing like the radio or like newspapers. They were crazy about movies. And uh, uh, for example, Hitler and Goebbels, they always watched a movie in the, in the evening. And um, it, uh, they, um, uh, Hitler has, has, has three things um, uh, when he watched a movie. Uh, first, the film is good, or the uh, second, the film is not good, or I don't want to uh, watch the movie further. Mm -hmm. And so um, his company had always to bring new movies to him and to Goebbels to watch them in the evening. So they were really crazy about movies. And this is also very strange because they love to see movies which were forbidden for the rest of Germany. For mm -hmm. example, the, um, uh, the King Kong movie. This was the, the favorite movie of, of Hitler. And, uh, uh, and it was forbidden uh, in Germany. It was shown under the strange title, King Kong and the White Woman. And then Goebbels realized, oh, uh, it could be seen as the uh, uh, love between a black person or a Jewish person and a white Aryan fair-haired beauty. And this couldn't be on the German screen. And so he banned the movie, but it was still one of the favorites of Hitler. And, mm -hmm. and so they used uh, film as a propaganda instrument because the uh, uh, new sound movie, it was just two or three years ago, that sound was invented. And so they realized with the uh, um, pictures, they could uh, bring their um, messages but to when, the Sorry, but when we speak about this production during the Nazi regime yeah. in Austria, we don't usually speak about what we usually think of pro propaganda films, right? I mean, that's the this, this special, yeah. Um, can we say a, a few words about that? You see, in Germany, around uh, 1,000 or 1,100 movies were produced in those 12 uh, uh, years. And um, the people went to the cinema, the, the figures were rising through the Second World War. More and more people went to the cinema. And in Austria from 1938 uh, uh, to 1945, um, around 40 or 50 mu movies were produced. So those are the, the figures. And of course, Goebbels wanted not direct propaganda. There are direct propaganda movies, but he wanted propaganda as entertainment. Mm -hmm. And this was very important for Goebbels, even with uh, um, uh, movies about fairy tales and stuff like that from, from the Brothers Grimm mm -hmm. or, uh, uh, or others. And um, for the uh, so-called uh, Wien film, uh, 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 the films of, um, from the uh, production um, studio in Vienna, he wanted typical Viennese comedies, opera, music, uh, musical films. And this was the demand of the propaganda minister. And um, already in 1935, 36, 
um, there was um, a, a, a contract between Germany and Austria that no Jewish um, actress or something could work in the Austrian industry. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they would ban the movie in, Aust in, in Germany. And um, this is, uh, um, so the, the, the connection be began already uh, years before. And then all the um, production studios were forced into one and uh, into minor studios. But the, the major studio was this uh, Wien film. We have seen the picture just. Uh, yeah, uh, these are all Wien before. film productions. Yeah. yeah. And um, there was some director here, he, he came from Germany, but the, the chief of production was Karl Hartl. And uh, so the task was they had to uh, uh, shoot uh, Austrian comedies or musical films and not directly propaganda movies. And this was a, a, um, a walk on a narrow ridge, the whole thing. On the, on the one side, they had to bring typical Austrian elements from history, uh, from the Habsburg Empire, uh, with the Viennese dialect and stuff like that. But Austria has to be shown as part of Germany. And this never worked out completely. Uh, it was always, you see here, the famous actor Hans Moser on the right side. He was a big uh, comedian and he always uh, used the Viennese dialect and his task for Goebbels was um, his kind of figure, the typical Viennese uh, citizen. He has to, um, yeah, to suffer and to see that the German um, uh, way of life is better than the Austrian. But the audience loved him and not the Aryan couple or, or others in, in the movies. And um, this was a, a kind of, of a problem. And there were movies who were uh, yeah, subversive in their way when they strengthened the, uh, the, typical, uh, the, the typical Austrian uh, way of life against the German. German ideals of male and female uh, bodies and all the on also marriage and uh, stuff like that and this and sometimes um, uh, they succeeded but it's a difference between the German subversive movies who were more directly subversive like Reinhold Schünzel or Dance on the Volcano by, uh, with Gründgens it was, it was much uh, um, a greater difference in the uh, ki kind of uh, showing our resistance here. Um, Klaus, um, do the, these uh, films were presented and screened also in Austria and also in Germany? And could you say a few words about how the audience react to them? I mean, could you s different between the reaction of Austrian uh, viewers and that ones of the Germans? <laughs> um, sometimes uh, many, of, although many of the films, they had to cut off the dialect because Goebbels was afraid that the Northern Germans wouldn't understand a word. Wow. And, uh, um, uh, but there is a famous movie by Willy Faust here we see uh, Wiener Blue. This is the, the same uh, the movie I'm talking about. Okay, you see it's, it's a, a kind of musical film about the Habsburg Empire, but sometimes then they are speaking in dialect or in, in another movie, Vienna Tales, they are directly, um, uh, you have this in the dialogue, they are talking about the parliament. Oh, there are no debates anymore at the parliament. We, could, we can't uh, debate there anymore. So this was directly uh, a, a critic of the uh, uh, Third Reich. There are no other uh, opinions were allowed. And um, 
Only in one case, uh, Goebbels saw that this is subversive. This was the movie Schrammeln. It's about uh, uh, Fiaka Millie, a famous female in, uh, in Vienna. And there was a song. And in the song, the line is, how beautiful Austria is. And this was changed in, uh, in how beautiful everything here is. And later they dubbed it again in Austria after the Second World War. Um, can, can we identify in the movies um, all kinds of Third Reich ideas regarding the Jews or these subject matters are really not seen on the screen? In uh, the Wien film produces four movies which were, which were direct propaganda movies. And um, first we have here uh, this uh, movie about Karl Luega. And there we have strong anti-Semitic uh, scenes. Um, also figures like the anti-Semite Georg von Schönerer. But this, mo uh, this movie was not a great success. It was shot by a director E. W. Emo, who was better in doing comedies. Yeah. And so we have uh, a typical uh, Aryan performance by Forster as Carl Luega, but um, the, the movie was not shown in, in Austria. Uh, it was only shown, shown in, um, in some of the Axis countries and it was, was not a great success. But um, you see, we have an, an Austrian actor called Siegfried Breuer, and he played always the slimy seducer. And he also played uh, uh, strong anti-Semitic characters in uh, propaganda movies in Germany, mm -hmm. uh, like uh, um, uh, Venus uh, and others, two um, of them. And then he played in Vienna in an anti-Semitic comedy, Linen for Ireland, and this actor, he, um, he nearly played Jesus because uh, mm -hmm. he was so good in this uh, slimy um, Jewish uh, character. Um, and Billy Faust, the director, and also he was a famous uh, actor, he was hated by Goebbels and Hitler because uh, uh, they thought he, he looks like a Jew. And so uh, they didn't like him and he hit his by uh, sexuality. And so for him, it was uh, very dangerous to be too open, but he was the one who forced the typical Austrian Habsburg uh, um, movie uh, in, in the forties. And uh, there was also, um, um, the most vicious propaganda movie, in my opinion, he is much uh, uh, on the same level like Ju Zeus. It's the movie Heimkehr, Coming Home. I don't know what is the English title with Paula Vesely. Uh, and this movie is very famous because it is about uh, the, it's not about Vienna, it's not about Austria, it's about Poland and about the uh, Germans in Poland who suffers under the uh, um, German, uh, under the Polish uh, government and under the Jews. It's a very uh, strong anti-Semitic uh, and anti-Polish movie. It's horrible. And the uh, crucial thing is that Paula Vesely and all the other actors and also the director, Gustav Uczycki, they are very good. And so it's, a, uh, in the artificial way, it's a very good movie, but with, a hor with horrible messages and horrible uh, lines in the movie. And later, Paula Vesely uh, has to, um, yeah, excuse herself and beg for forgiveness their whole life. Well, that's the point when I want to go and, and speak about what's going on after the war. Can we see any difference between this industry, this film industry before and after? Can we see any signs of aftermath resistance 
um, what's happened to all these people working and 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 coping in in the in Austrian film industry during the war? I just have to add uh, uh, one point to yeah, the uh, totally. last point because um, you see, in in Germany, they always in the propaganda movies or in the movies shot during the Third Reich, they looked back into the 18th century in the uh, times of enlightenment. They uh, look back to Prussia and to geniuses like Schiller mm -hmm. and uh, others, or like the uh, Frederick the Emperor. But in the Austrian movies, they looked back into the Biedermeier, into the Viennese Biedermeier. And this was a totally different time. Mm -hmm. It couldn't be absorbed for the uh, 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 typical propaganda uses. And this was also a difference in what kind of topics we choose when we are showing so-called historical movies. And also the, the Mozart movie by Karl Hartl, who was the producer, it's very different from the Schiller and all the other movies shot in Germany because this Mozart is so soft. He has, he's, he has no demons to fight. He is a typical Viennese. And so it's much different from uh, uh, all these other kinds of propaganda. And in this movie, you see the difference in the languages, in the dialects. And there we have Kurt Jürgens as uh, the emperor, uh, uh, Joseph II. And he, he could not understand one of his ministers because he's talking in the Viennese dialect. And he asked him, please repeat yourself. I don't understand. And so you, you always see the um, emphasizing on the national elements yeah. in those movies. One side Goebbels wanted some kind of uh, Viennese elements, but not too strong. And so it was always uh, a kind of walk between, be uh, between uh, what can we do and what should we do and stuff like that. And, but, most, yeah. and most of the films are really entertainment films, as yeah. you said. Yeah, entertainment genres. Mm -hmm. uh, like you said, so what's 10%, happening? Ten percent yeah. were direct for, because forty movies, four movies directly, uh, uh, propaganda movies. So what's happened after the war? What, after, what, yeah. what can you say about what's going on in the film industry after the war? Mm -hmm. After the war, we had uh, uh, the three uh, studios, and one was in the in the hands of the Russians, and and uh, so Wien film existed still up to the 80s, but uh, the most interesting years are the years after the Second World War, before Austria became independent and neutral. Yeah. And uh, it's very strange to, to watch at, uh, those uh, four movies, which were very interesting. Uh, there are the other, other movies which were shot after the Second uh, World War, and the German and also the Austrian uh, industry, they had to deal with their heritage. And we have here two heritages, if you um, say so. We have the um, uh, cinema of the 20s mm -hmm. with all these uh, expressionistic views and uh, movies like Orlach's Hands or uh, uh, Metropolis in, from Germany. And then you have the dark heritage of the uh, Third Reich movies, of this uh, Nazi cinema. And now uh, there were also new elements invented, for example, in Italy, uh, the neorealistic uh, cinema or uh, in the States by the immigrants. The but we have to say something. The, the uh, film production studios did not, uh, was not destroyed as it happened in Italy. It, it, yeah. doesn't, it didn't happen. Yeah, there were destruction, of course, but they started to uh, shoot movies uh, like in, in, in Germany uh, around 48 with, um, with uh, new uh, movies. And yeah, we have uh, here directors like Karl Hartl, who was the chief of Wien Film. Yeah. And then uh, when you see those four movies, only one of them became so famous 
that uh, um, they, were, they were shown in the, in, the, in the cinema all over up to today, also in, in the tele, in, in television and also in DVD and, and, and stuff like that, the, the Angel with the Trumpet. And this movie is in many ways horrible. Why? It's based on a um, very good novel by Ernst uh, uh, Lothar. And Ernst Lothar was a Jew who uh, immigrated and later uh, came back. And uh, the problem is this good novel was destroyed uh, in the movie because all uh, most of the interesting Jewish characters were um, yeah, eliminated. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, also the death of the so-called uh, half-Jewish uh, character played by Paula Vesely. Uh, she was not killed like in a novel, but uh, uh, committed suicide and others. So it was very softened um, very version good. of the book. And for Paula Vesely, it was uh, like... Um, like going into a riddle bath and going into the mikve. It showed the audience, look, I was in those in this terrible movie coming home, Heimkehr, but now I am, I, Paula Wesley, I am playing a Jewish character. So please, let's forget the past. So basically most of the actresses and the film producer and the screenwriters and the directors just continues yeah yeah they continued but with uh, in different uh, parts and on the right side you see this green character mm -hmm. in the uh, uh, poster this is Siegfried Breuer he played as I mentioned before before the the slimy seducers the uh, the Jewish characters and now he's he, he again plays a slimy character but a Nazi yeah so <laughs> But, yeah, it, it's um, a, it's a shifting, but it's the same same character, uh, not the same characters, but the same actors, the same actresses, and the same directors. And you know, in in Germany, they tried to uh, to bring the director of Jesus into the into the prison. There were two or three uh, trials against him, and he went out free. So if you can't bring White Harlan with Jew Jews, which yeah. was shown to the uh, SS in yeah. the camps and so on, and before uh, mass executions to stimulate the, the, the SS to shoot the Jews, then you can't bring Paula Vesely or any other into who prison. Made, who made musicals. Yeah, who made musicals or entertainment. The, uh, sometimes they had to, uh, to uh, they are not allowed to work, but mm -hmm. then came also the politics from the uh, so-called Cold War. Uh, uh, Germany is now our friend and, and Austria too, so we have to be kind to, to the people, we need them. And so after also Ferdinand Marianne, who played Jew Zeus, he was allowed to act again, and he was so glad that he could work again that he drank too much and then uh, he uh, had an accident with his car and died uh, 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 during the accident but every other uh, could work again uh, only Heinrich George uh, he uh, was uh, captured by the Russians and he died in the Russian camp because there was no medicine Mm -hmm. for uh, uh, his uh, illness and the others they acted um, like before or they started their career like Kurt Jürgens or other actors so this was the angel of the trumpet who was so successful that this was uh, also a, a English version uh, mm -hmm. shot in, in, in England uh, but with material from the Austrian movie and the other three are very interesting topics and the best of them. Um, yeah, there's still no DVD, no Blu-ray, nothing of it. And uh, it was never shown in the Austrian television, by the way. Uh, it's the process. It's a strong movie against anti-Semitism. It's based on the ritual murder 
uh, in Tisla Eschla in, in Hungary. And um, this was very, uh, uh, very interesting because we see here a famous director, G.W. Pabst from uh, the uh, Weimar cinema. Yeah. And he was yeah. the director and also very good actors like Balsa or Josef Meiner. But he was, he was working during the Nazi regime as well, right? Yeah, he showed, uh, he showed one. Yeah. of this uh, famous genius uh, uh, movies about uh, Paracelsus. This was the only, let's, it's not a directly propaganda movie, but it is uh, the typical genius movie uh, uh, Goebbels wanted. Yeah. But the, the process is, uh, it's a very good film uh, because it showed the and this is very strange. It was, must have been very strange for the few people who watched this movie. Yeah. <clears throat> Four years ago, they are used to see Orthodox Jews as horrible or nasty, devilish persons. And now they see all the same Orthodox Jews as victims. Uh, uh, they need uh, help and they are people like the others. And this was a strong message four years uh, after the Shoah. But you said the, those movies were not shown on television and they were not shown on like cinema during the years. So what's happening between the 50s and the 80s if we're going to mm -hmm. close the discussion in a few, uh, in a few minutes? The uh, movie uh, The Other Life, Das, das Andere Leben, uh, it is now on, on DVD. Last year it came out. First and, time? First time last year. Yeah, it's first time uh, last year and was shown by the Film Archive Austria twice or something at tele uh, on television. But uh, the other duel with, uh, with Dev, who uh, is about uh, resistance, also Jewish resistance during uh, the Second World War, uh, duel with Dev. You see, it's it's hard to find a poster yeah. by this, uh, 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 from this movie because there is no material. And uh, he's not on DVD and others, and he's also produced by Pabst, who is so famous. And yeah, nothing. Um, yeah, I, I call it- Is there any representation of the Shoah during these uh, this years, during the, the 50 to the 80s? I would say it is, there are movies about the Second World War. Yeah, obviously. But without, yeah. But, but without showing uh, uh, the Shoah in Austrian cinema. And when Austria became a, a state again, we have here, I would say, the gap <laughs> or the, uh, the void yeah. because they are, they are only uh, showing uh, comedies, drama, stuff like that, but there is no Jewish representation, uh, no Jewish characters, no Jewish figures, not only from the past, but, all, but also there are no Jews in the presence. Yeah. And, but you have on television. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So please say yeah. something about the television term, <laughs> television, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, television role in what yeah. might be. Uh, a, a different yeah. uh, area. In the 60s, there was al also um, TV movies like Mr. Karl with mm -hmm. Mike Waltinger, and there were movies by Axel Korty and by Michael Kehlemann um, based on famous literature by Schnitzler or Josef Roth, Hiob, and um, uh, other stuff. So in the cinemas, nothing, but we have those uh, liter uh, literature adaptions for uh, television. In, in, in television, but the the strongest event was in Germany, as also in in Austria, the screening of the TV show Holocaust. But not only the screening, class yeah. that was because also the shooting and all production. Yeah, the whole the whole production um, was in Vienna. It was uh, filmed in Vienna because the uh, uh, Poland and other countries. They refused uh, NBC to shoot there because they saw the movie uh, as Zionistic propaganda. And so they couldn't shoot at Auschwitz or in Poland. And so they 
should all the scenes which should take place in Poland or in Prague in Vienna. And um, they also made the casting here in Vienna and nearly the, the, the whole Jewish community or uh, uh, many of the Jewish community played um, minor roles or just uh, background figures uh, in the, tele in, in the, the uh, Holocaust movie. So this is like uh, a beginning for a whole new discussion about television representation. Um, thank you so much, uh, Professor Davidovich, for this enlightening conversation. And Tamir, uh, the floor is yours. I'm gonna do unshare. <laughs> thank you so much. Please, you're welcome. <laughs> and thank you both very much. I, I... As you were talking, I was just remembering that there was a program, uh, I think one of the first uh, conferences that I went to in uh, Vienna was uh, the 25, 25th anniversary of Holocaust mm -hmm. uh, and how, uh, how Germans, Austrians reacted uh, to the, the television movie. It was a very interesting uh, conference. So it seems like uh, just a few years ago, there was a big yeah. talk about uh, the film. But it's, it, it's very interesting, for example, for the uh, uh, guests from the States, that the German version was different to the uh, original version. Absolutely. Because mm -hmm. 20 minutes, the whole uh, end of the fourth part was cut. And it was very ambiguous because the uh, television company who, that, uh, who did the dubbing of the movie uh, the WDR, they uh, told, uh, told us, yeah, we had to cut it because we wanted the ending with the um, uh, thing that the German family is discussing that their father was a Nazi and so it's better to end here and not showing what happens to Rudy. And, uh, but you have also then uh, the other argument that the Zionistic ending or the pro-Israel ending is also cut from the movie because Rudy is helping the partisans and uh, not, uh, not only helping the partisans, but joining the Haganah to help Greek uh, uh, kids going to Israel. And so this very important thing is cut from the German version. And only when the 25th uh, anniversary came, they uh, put the ending with subtitles into the new version and also into the new Blu-ray of the movie. But when we watched it in 1979, we never knew the uh, ending. Ah, that's interesting. I didn't even know that. So thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I'm going to hand over the uh, floor to Tamir, who has gathered a few questions, very interesting questions in the chat box. So Tamir, uh, and once again, I want to say thank you to Tamir for organizing this uh, event today, and the floor is yours. Um, thank you, Madin, and uh, thank you, Dr. Mossad and Professor Davidovich for a fascinating conversation. And uh, as preparing this evening, we were uh, talking that maybe it should be as a two, as a two parts. <laughs> uh, now, now I understand, uh, everyone understand why. Uh, so um, maybe I'll begin with the uh, two questions, mm -hmm. uh, just collect them together. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one is a question by uh, Tamara Jankovic. Thank you, Tamara. Uh, and she's asking which movie uh, would you choose as the first openly uh, admitting Austrian uh, uh, anti Semitism and uh, collaboration with uh, Nazism? Mm -hmm. And uh, the second one is by uh, Mark B. Uh, and he's asking uh, Was Lenny Riefenstahl influential in Australian film uh, making? Mm -hmm. Um, Leni Riefenstahl was not important after the Second World War uh, in Austrian uh, filmmaking. She was working on her own legend, uh, and this was especially in Germany. Uh, many uh, uh, German directors and um, filmmakers, they, uh, they loved her and supported her and also believed all her lies about her life. And... Um, the, uh, yeah, yeah, the, the plain influence she had in, uh, in, in the States. And uh, you, if you watch the first Star Wars movie by uh, George Lucas, you see directly scenes which were 
uh, uh, put uh, from uh, Triumph of the Will, the ending of Star Wars and uh, stuff like that. So she was very influential, but not uh, in the Austrian film industry after the Second World War. I would say um, the uh, so-called um, uh, uh, time after the Second World War, the post-war uh, things, they ended in Austria, in my opinion, also, Ruth Beckermann said that very late. Uh, all, it, it ended with uh, the Waldheim uh, scandal in the late 80s. And then they started to shoot movies about uh, uh, the Shoah and stuff uh, like that. Also about resistance, collaboration. And I would say it, it's the uh, trilogy by Axel Corti. Uh, back, wohin uh, zurück, back and, and forth, I don't know the English title. Welcome to Vienna, the third part is very, uh, is very famous. He uh, ran in the French theaters for weeks. And um, yeah, the, this uh, film, um, based on the uh, memories by Georg Stefan Troller, this was the first uh, huge thing um, by uh, made by the the Austrians about the Second World War. All right, thank you very much, uh, Klaus, and uh, uh, we'll, we'll use your uh, knowledge and experience in the next question by Angel. Uh, she's asking, could you comment on the movie City Without Jews of uh, uh, 1924? Why was such a movie done so early? It was not yet in the picture. Mm -hmm. um, this movie is also very ambiguous. It's a silent uh, movie based uh, on, um, on the uh, uh, novel by Hugo Bettauer, who was a Jew, but he converted to Protestantism. And he was also very famous in, um, yeah, he, he had uh, one journal about the sexual revolution and stuff like that. And he was murdered by an illegal Nazi in his uh, office here in Vienna. And the movie is based on his novel, City Without uh, Jews. But the movie um, is uh, not, um, re not yet restored. They found parts of the movie. It left, it was, I think, 30 minutes uh, were, were destroyed. And then they found in a Paris uh, a flea market uh, to three or four years ago, um, 15 minutes of the movie and so it was restored but not completely restored um, but it is a very ambiguous movie because when you have scenes which are in my opinion are anti-semitic and also the, um, uh, the, the orthodox characters how they were presented in the movies and only the good Jews are the assimilated Jews who are, who are converted to Christianity. So um, it's a, a good movie to, to um, discuss anti-Semitism and also elements of anti-Semitism, but it's not a strong movie about anti-Semitism because it's uh, ambiguous uh, itself. Yeah? All right, thank you. Uh, Medin, you got that more question? No, I mean, there is, there's one more question I think that I want to uh, uh, pose to you that we got. I, it came to me directly, so I'm not sure that everybody saw it, but I think a lot of people ask that when we talk about post-war anything. Mm -hmm. uh, which of the actors and directors and people involved in the movie making during the Nazi regime in Austria continued afterwards? Uh, and someone also asked, was anyone uh, made accountable? I don't think you can make a be made accountable for propaganda, but... Um, kind of the questions go together. Basically, what happens after uh, World War II, the same people who made movies that were propaganda are now continuing and starting to change direction? No, um, they uh, changed not direction, they, they changed, uh, for example, the topic. So- they <laughs> Very <comedy>. simple. <laughs> they made, uh, comedies or musical films and stuff like that. But sometimes uh, they could not hide their background. Uh, for example, uh, in Germany, it's the White Harlan who made a movie about uh, uh, homosexuality, and the title is uh, "They are other, they are different than you, anders als du und ich." So uh, sometimes it's it's uh, coming through. <laughs> 
but normally they uh, did the, the the normal genres uh, which were popular uh, during the times. It's more interesting what happened uh, to the few directors who came back, the Jewish uh, um, uh, directors or the Jewish actors or actresses who came back to uh, Berlin or to Vienna. And it's very interesting to see that uh, uh, very uh, famous Jewish actors were the villains in the uh, German crimes, uh, mm -hmm. crime movies in the 60s. For example, uh, Pinkas Braun, who is a very good, and very famous Jewish actor, he always played the, the bad guy in the crime uh, movies because he's so dark and so sinister and stuff like that. And also um, Leon Askin, who are also playing in comedies and was very famous in the US, when he was doing uh, German or in Austrian movies, he's always on the side of the uh, villains or murderers and stuff like that. So this is a very interesting side uh, part. Wow, that, that is incredible. Someone just asked if there were any movies made in Yiddish, which is a very interesting question as well. Mm -hmm. But I think that at this point, I want to once again thank uh, uh, Dana and Klaus for uh, intriguing uh, interview conversation. And like Tamir said, we can continue <laughs> to part two because it really is such a fascinating and complex uh, subject and it makes uh, to see a micro history of one country, especially Austria, and see the connection so close to uh, Germany, and yet what happens in the movies before, during, and after uh, the Nazi regime is just uh, fascinating. Uh, I want to thank uh, Dr. Tamir Hod as well, my partner in crime, uh, mm -hmm. for putting together this incredible evening and finding these two uh, speakers. Again, I want to thank uh, uh, the Friedrich Ebert uh, Foundation and Judith for uh, making this uh, program possible. So thank you again, everybody. And hopefully we'll see you all on Thursday for our next online program. Shalom. Shalom.